Welcome to everyone uh, to this uh, webinar, uh, another Fujita Health University Alumni Association webinar. Uh, I can see many friends uh, online. Of course, Professor Yoko Kato, who is uh, our main uh, uh, sponsor and tutor. And uh, thank you to Raja and uh, Liu for uh, hosting these webinars. Uh, my co-chair, Ishu Bishnoi, yes, he is here. So thank you. And today we have two uh, great speakers, uh, Professor Kojiro Wada and uh, Dr. Sandeep Talari. Both of them are great friends, first of all, uh, and not only uh, great neurosurgeons. Uh, so I think we uh, should start uh, with the first speaker, who is uh, actually uh, Professor Kojiro Wada. He is a chair professor of the Department of Neurosurgery, National Defense Medical College, Tokorozawa, Saitama, Japan. Uh, he uh, published several papers and he uh, is uh, a usual speaker at several uh, meetings. Uh, he is also affiliated to many um, societies, for example, Japanese uh, Neurosurgical Society, Japanese Congress of Neurosurg Neurological Surgeons, the Japan Association for Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism, and the Japanese Society of Hyperbaric and Undersea Medicine. Actually, I was thinking maybe next time you can talk uh, about uh, something uh, related to undersea <laughs> neurosurgery <laughs> or... Uh, medicine, very interesting topic. But today, uh, the topic of, uh, Professor Kojiro Wada will uh, talk about uh, is how to treat high position carotid endarterectomy. Uh, I think it's a very uh, interesting topic, not in uh, all the neurosurgical departments, uh, uh, neurosurgeons uh, do this kind of operation. For example, in my institution, uh, uh, this operation is performed by vascular surgeons, uh, but I think uh, neurosurgeons uh, must be able uh, to deal with uh, uh, carotid artery at the neck. So uh, I think it's very important uh, to, to listen to this, uh, uh, to this talk. And thank you very much, Professor Wada, for being here. Uh, you can start your talk, please. Thank you, Albert. I'm going to start my lecture. My name is Kojiro Wada from Japan. Thank you very much for Albert to introduce me. I'm very honored to have a great opportunity today. I really appreciate Dr. Yoko Kato to give me such a great chance. Today, I'm talking about high position carotid endarterectomy. Carotid bifurcation of mongoloid is reported half whatever body higher than Caucasian. We sometimes meet high carotid bifurcation with internal carotid artery stenosis. Reportedly 20 through 40 percent. We should know how to treat the high carotid bifurcation carotid endarterectomy. For the high position carotid endarterectomy, I'm talking about head position, skin incision, lateral mandibular space opening, dissection of distal internal carotid artery, which consists of translocation of hypoglossal nerve and also steroid diaphragm. Then I'm talking about the cadaver dissection. And uh, finally, I talk carotid and adrectomy case. General anesthesia and uh, not Nasal intubation, but oral intubation. Oral intubation is enough for the high position carotid endarterectomy. 
patient head is placed on the horseshoe hairrest. Head position is very important. This patient is the left side carotid and the direct patient. For the high position, we conducted to wide the lateral mandibular space. For this purpose, first thin up and the head tilt to opposite side and a little bit tilt and placed on the horseshoe headrest. Red line shows the skin incision. Using right neck wrinkle, transverse skin incision is made. Right picture shows regular skin incision. Compared to regular skin incision, skin incision elongated to the mastoid process. Left picture. First, we need to know about the anatomy of external and also internal jugular veins surrounding the carotid artery. As long as this dissection of retro mandibular space is necessary, external jugular vein A through D and great auricular nerve a guide to the party land. Finally, external jugular vein is secure, ligated, and cut. Carotid triangle is made by sphenocrenoid muscle muscle, over here the muscle, and the posterior belly of digastric muscle and considered to the guiding of carotid artery. However, dissection of all three muscles is too wide to get carotid artery. So common facial vein designed H instead of omohyoid muscle is useful to use the landmark of the anterior border of dissection along to the posterior belly of digastric muscle. Common facial vein is finally the ligated and cut. Now you can find common carotid artery, external carotid artery, and internal carotid artery. Until this step, regular carotid endarterectomy. So next, posterior side of the posterior belly of diagastric muscle is dissected as long as possible to open the retal mandibular space. There is no dangerous anatomical structure, shallow ward and the posterior belly of the diagnostic muscle. I usually use a weight runner detractor to open the lateral mandibular space. For the first step to reveal the distal internal artery is translocation of hypoglossal nerve. Hypoglossal nerve covers distal internal carotid artery, and this nerve is anchored by senocleid mastoid artery and occipital artery. Hypoglossal nerve runs along to the internal carotid artery inside carotid seeds. In the first step, is secure the both sternocleid muscle artery and orchistal artery and ligated and cut. Then cut the 
anthocyte colleagues and translocation of hypoglossal nerve. Caries. I showed the video of the first step. Senograde mastoid artery is secured, ligated, and cut. Vein is also coagulated. And cut. Ansasabicalis is cut. The carotid sheath is secured and uh, detracted posteriorly. Officital artery is dissected and secured and cut. Distal carotid sheath is dissected free from the hypoglossal nerve and coagulated and cut. And the hypoglossal nerve dissected from the carotid artery. Second step is dissection of steroid diaphragm. Distal internal carotid artery is covered by the steroid diaphragm. The steroid diaphragm is considered consisted four muscles and two ligaments. We can get more space in the parapharyngeal space to cut of posterior belly of digastric muscle and also cut the steroid muscle. The function of both muscles are to tension the vocal cord. We can cut the both muscles without, without any damage to the swallowing or obvious formation. I named this method as transsteroid diaphragm approach. I investigated using 14 cadaver necks. How length do I get using this approach? Distal internal carotid artery is covered by steroid diaphragm. Posterior belly of diagastric muscle and also steroid muscle are cut. Carotid sheath is dissected distally. These photos are final view of dissection. Gross pharyngeal nerve is the distal end of this approach. I measured from carotid bifurcation to occipital artery, which stands for first step dissection, and also occipital artery to the gross pharyngeal nerve, which stands for the second step of transsteroid diaphragm approach. Using the transsteroid diaphragm approach, we can get more distal internal carotid artery, about 14 millimeter. 
I'll show the case presentation. 68-year-old male suffered symptomatic left internal carotid artery stenosis. Distal plaque is elongated to the level of middle of second vertebral body. This is the video of the transsteroid diaphragm approach. Posterior belly of diagnostic muscle is dissected. Secured and cut. Divided diagastric muscle is secured and pulled anteriorly and also posteriorly. Stenocrate mastoid artery is coagulated and cut. Occipital artery also secured, ligated, and cut. And then hypoglossal nerve is dissected and ansasabicaris is cut. Then steroid muscle is dissected secured and cut. Steroid muscle also pulled anteriorly and posteriorly. The distal carotid cease is dissected and secured the distal internal carotid artery. This is the final view. This is uh, three steps of the high position carotid endarterectomy. Figure 1 shows radial dissection, only 15 mm internal carotid artery is revealed. Figure 2 shows essential method, uh, which means the first step of the high carotid artery dissection. We can get 5 mm more distal. Figure 3 shows the steroid diaphragm approach step. We can get 15 mm more distal of internal carotid artery. And uh, this is the final view of the, this method. I'll show the flag dissection video. Internal shunt tube was used and the plug resection was performed as regular carotid and atherectomy. Distal end of the plug of internal carotid artery was dissected. And then to the common carotid artery, the plug is dissected. The proximal side of plug and dissected and cut. The plug is very soft and partial liquid formation. 
we stand for lipid rich necrotic core. The common side is cut. Superior thyroid artery block also dissected and cut. The external carotid artery plug also dissected and cut. All plug was removed successfully. We can see intraplug hemorrhage and ulcer formation. During operation, X-ray using C-arm confirmed the Sugita ring grip, which secured distal internal carotid artery internal shunt tube. It exists the planning level of C2 vertebral body. Internal carotid artery is primary sutured and re I reconstructed both steroid -hioid, steroid muscle and posterior belly of digastric muscle. Post-operative course was uneventful. CT angiography showed good patency of internal carotid artery. No new ischemic region is observed in MRI diffusion study. Wound is satisfied condition. We performed 14 cases of high position carotid endarterectomy from 2015, four patients cut digastric muscle only, six patients cut both digastric muscle and steroid muscle. No ischemic complication nor ischemic lesion in MRI was observed in all patients. The photo show after operation one month left side and two months right slide after operation. Skin wound is not identified from anterior view at chronic stage. Wound scar is satisfied in other patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Wada, for this uh, nice, uh, very anatomical <laughs> presentation. Uh, so I think uh, we have uh, time for some question, if some of you uh, want to ask to Professor Wada. I actually have uh, some questions, Professor. Yes. Uh, my first question is uh, related to um, reconstruction at the end uh, of the operation. So uh, you, you showed that you have to uh, cut, for example, uh, digastric muscle or uh, stylohyoid muscle. Uh, do you reconstruct all these muscles at the end? Do you have a specific technique to, to reconstruct these structures? This is my first question. And the second question is related to uh, your experience uh, in uh, potential anatomical variations. So my question is, have you found in your experience uh, any anatomical variation in the patients uh, you operated 
uh, along these uh, anatomical steps. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, for, for first uh, question is uh, how how can I do the deconstruct of the um, posterior value of diagastric muscle, also the hypo uh, 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 steroid heroid muscle? Uh, yes. I usually I usually reconstruct both muscles. Not special technique I have, ju just uh, sutured, that's all. So, uh, but the muscle is a little bit, uh, uh, string stream is a uh, uh, but uh, to transverse, transverse, yeah. transverse. So ju just to uh, suture, it's not to uh, uh, connect, right, doesn't right. connect. So yeah. first, uh, switch at bo both end and uh, tie up uh -huh. to, okay. to, to string and yeah. then connect. Yeah, 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 yeah. After okay. that, I can switch it, uh, bo both connect to uh, switch uh, tightly. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I always reconstruct both muscles. And next uh, uh, question is uh, anatomical va variation of the high position carotid endarterectomy, right? Yeah. Uh, anatomically, it's uh, no, not so many anatomical variation, but uh, anatomically vein is a little bit variation and the internal jugular vein have a little bit uh, variation. So I always check before surgery, not only the artery, but also the veins. So jugular veins. Hmm. Usually jugular vein run uh, shallow and the posterior side of the internal carotid artery. So not no no so no not so many trouble but the left side sometimes left side reported a two through three percent there are some uh, variation so uh, I always check both uh, anyway both side of the uh, internal jugular vein and also uh, uh, artery sometimes tortures. So uh, external carotid artery tortures and elongated to the um, internal carotid artery. So internal carotid artery is straight, but uh, external carotid artery tortures and elongated shallow part run a shallow part of the internal carotid artery so uh, there is no no big problem but uh, uh, I always uh, care about the external carotid arteries uh, course so uh, anyway uh, CT angiography before surgery helped me to uh, how to treat uh, external carotid artery also. Oh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. I see uh, Sandeep uh, raised the hand, so I guess uh, he wants to ask something. Okay. Uh, unmute Sandeep, please. We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. No. Hmm. You are mute, but we cannot hear you. No way. disappear <laughs> <laughs> well while we are waiting for Sandeep to come back maybe uh, 
some uh, some other guys want to ask uh, questions to Professor Wada. Oh, Professor Wada, hey. uh, can can I have one question for you? Sure, sure. Thank uh, you very uh, much. Uh, yeah. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, e uh, even though you cut the digestive muscle, but you cannot uh, approach to the region like a very high position of the stenotic point. Uh, uh, did you have uh, an experience to perform uh, mandibulectomy? I mean to cut the mandibular bone for to perform this kind of uh, CA? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chai. Uh, I have no experience to cut the mandibular uh, I just only to cut the uh, both muscles, and uh, that maybe I sh I have to say the limitation of the upper side. So first, vertebral body. I mean the uh, first <coughs> first vertebral body, uh, uh, the distal side of the stenosis is a. Uh, uh, this limitation because the hypo uh, to hypoglossal nerve no no uh, uh, to, uh, uh, glossopharyngeal mm, nerve sorry glossopharyngeal nerve run the uh, distal side of the internal carotid artery. So this nerve is uh, uh, very difficult to uh, dissect. And uh, if the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve damage, it's uh, very dangerous to uh, complicate, to shallow. Uh, so sometimes, uh, uh, it's a very uh, complicated problem, hoarseness and uh, sh sh difficulty of sh shallowing. So oh, this is uh, for the, the for reveal the gross nerve, this method is enough, not necessary to cut the mandibular. Anyway, if you cut the mandibula, I can't treat the gross pharyngeal nerve anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think no necessary to cut the uh, mandibula. Thank you, Professor. That's okay. <laughs> okay. May okay, I... let's see if uh, we can hear Sandeep now. Am I audible now? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Welcome back. Yeah, Professor Wada, we, uh, yes. it's nice to meet you again after so long time. Nice to meet you again. Okay. Uh, recently, uh, I was operating a case of car carotid endotrectomy along with my vascular surgeon colleague. And he was the main surgeon at that time. So initially after the arteriotomy, and he had got the uh, 10 French Pruy in a shunt. 10 French Pruy in a shunt. And after the arteriotomy, when, he was, when we were trying to put in the shunt, it was not possible to put in the shunt. So uh, is there any way that we can uh, measure the size of the shunt and uh, I mean the size of the shunt required before pre I mean in the preoperative period and the second question is that uh, after the removal of the plaque he had re removed the saphenous vein graft and he has used it for closure and uh, I was insisting on primary closure then but he said that uh, they never do primary closure and they do closure with the uh, saphenous vein graft only because it may cause uh, carotid stenosis if they do primary closure. So what are your, uh, what is your opinion on the, both the questions? Thank you very much for your question. The first question is uh, internal shunt tube, about the internal shunt tube. Yeah, the yeah. size, yeah, uh, Prit Inahara the also, ha ha, they have uh, two variation. One is uh, three meter, three millimeter, uh, wide and the other one is uh, I think a 2.5 millimeter wide 
a little bit small one they have, I think. So uh, you, I, if you can get uh, a small size, uh, you can use instead of the regular Purito Inahara. And the Purito Inahara used to be a, a little bit hard component, but now they changed to the soft, so soft tube. So I usually use uh, Furui type, Furui, Furui type internal shunt tube. Uh, that's uh, almost the same size uh, and the wide width is three meter, three millimeter. So I always use uh, three millimeter uh, uh, with sun shunt tube that, that is good enough because uh, usually I measure the uh, um, distal internal carotid artery using the CT angiography before surgery. Almost all, all patients have uh, enough size more than the three millimeter. But uh, in case of the almost uh, 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 the the flow is uh, very, very slow patient, uh, it's difficult to measure the distal side, distal size. In this case, maybe we don't need the internal shunt tube if we cannot insert the distal ICA. So in that case, I don't use the internal shunt tube, very, very rare case. But uh, in this case, I don't use the internal shunt tube and uh, 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 try to uh, fast <laughs> to uh, finish. The first question. Yeah. The second question is uh, 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 primer closure or angioplasty. Uh, that's uh, hard to say because the uh, uh, angioplasty is better than a primary suture because the deep stenosis is uh, lower than a primary closure. But uh, I like a primary closure because the, <laughs> the process is a little bit uh, complicated compared to the primary closure. I know. Uh, so I love the primary closure. And uh, I always use the microscope, not uh, uh, not uh, 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 every time use the microscope. So uh, the primary closure very uh, uh, fine suture. I usually do. So that's not a big problem for me. So I, I like a primary closure. That's okay. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you, Professor. I see uh, Raja raised uh, his hand. Yes, Professor. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Right. Professor, uh, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful lecture. Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, let me congratulate all the organizers, Dr. Felity, and issue for the, this lecture. Uh, I would like to comment on two things and ask you one question regarding the question in continuation with uh, our uh, ATHI. He had asked about the mandibular resection, but instead our previous lecture on uh, carotid endarterectomy by Professor Takayuki Hara from Tokyo Metropolitan Hospital. He had described this technique of mandibular dislocation by using a dentist mouthpiece. So he found it very effective for treating high carotid, high position carotid bifurcation. And uh, when he came to the, uh, as a speaker and I asked him this question and he said that it may be useful in very high bifurcation, but he currently does not uh, utilize this technique. And regarding Sandeep's uh, one question that uh, he that he was not able to insert a shunt, 
I would like to commend that uh, the Sri Chitra Institute here in Trivandrum, the, the vascular surgeons perform the keratin and atratomy here. And they use a Riles tube of appropriate size as a shunt, right? So you could have tried uh, next time, maybe you can try a different size of a Riles tube. Uh, and uh, to, one question to Professor Kujirwada is that, uh, what is the indication of uh, using a shunt in keratid endactrotomy as we see in Bantane, where uh, uh, bispectral index or spectroscopy is used to utilize, uh, to assess the difference between the, uh, uh, between the readings of both the sides after clamping. And if the difference of clamping is more than 10%, they utilize a shunt. So what is in your practice, what is the indication for a, using a shunt? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments and uh, question. And uh, indication, you, you asked me the indication of the internal shunt tube. Uh, I always use the internal shunt tube because the preparation of the internal shunt tube is not enough because uh, in case of the uh, uh, aug aug augmentation of the blood flow. So, but uh, I always use the uh, somatosensory evoked potential and also uh, inbos mm, regional spectroscopy also use. So inbos indicate the flow of the uh, uh, cerebral cerebral blood flow. So instead of the cerebral blood flow, uh, inbos shows the uh, blood flow of the front frontal lobe. So uh, 18 de decrease uh, uh, 18 per percent of the first I measured compared to the first I measure and uh, if the decrease to the 80 percent, it's a dangerous sign. So, oh, maybe uh, that's an indication for the internal shunt tube. I always do the internal shunt tube, but uh, if the uh, uh, case by case you use, you want to use, I, I recommend 80 percent. And uh, also the ASCP, somatosensory evoked potential, 50% is a dangerous uh, sign. So the size of the uh, N20 decreased to the 50%, I recommend to use the internal shunt tube. And also another uh, surgeon indicate the stamp pressure of the uh, ICP, uh, in, internal carotid artery stamp pressure. And uh, stamp pressure decreased the 20 millimeter HG. That's a uh, need to the shunt tube. So oh, you should use the, I uh, recommend to use the internal shunt tube. Before surgery, uh, so cross flow to the uh, contralateral side, I mean the uh, for example, the anterior communicating artery, also the posterior communicating artery to the operating side, they have maybe a, a good collateral flow from the contralateral side or posterior circulation we can get. But uh, if there is no good uh, posterior communicating artery nor the anterior communicating artery or uh, uh, A1, A1 of the anterior cere cerebral artery, that's not a good idea for, or in case of the, uh, these dangerous uh, sign, awaiting uh, that this dangerous sign before surgery, I think we should prepare the internal shunt tube. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wada. Uh, 
Well, if there are no other questions to Professor Wada, we can move on. So now I ask uh, uh, my co-chair, uh, Professor Ishu Bishnoi, to uh, introduce our next speaker, please. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, our dear colleague and friend, Dr. Sandeep Telari, who is currently working as consultant neurosurgeon at uh, Care Hospital, Vishakha Patnam. He did his MCH in 2014 from King George Hospital, Vishakha Patnam, and did fellowship in cerebrovascular surgery under Professor Kato from September 2015 to Feb 2016. And uh, he was also trained under cerebral revascularization from Ashikawa Red Cross Hospital, Hokkaido in September 2017 to December 2017. He has published around 12 papers in national and international journals and also recipient of a gold medal in neurosurgery in 2014. And uh, today he will be presenting on poor grade aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage management. So I welcome Dr. Sandeep Tilari to present his presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ishu, for the kind words. Is my screen uh, visible? Yes. Okay. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Professor Kato and the organizing committee comprising Dr. Alberto and Dr. Ishu for giving me this opportunity. And today the topic for uh, of my presentation is management of poor grade aneurysmal SH. So as the time allotted to me by Dr. Alberto was around 15 to 20 minutes, I would uh, concentrate more on my personal experience rather than the theoretical aspect of this topic, which is very much uh, well known to all of you. So this is where I come from and where I work. This is on the uh, Vishapatnam on the east coast of uh, India. And it is uh, diagonally opposite to Mumbai. All of you must be knowing Mumbai. So Mumbai is on the west coast and we are on the east coast. So as you all know, aneurysmal SH is the most common cause of spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage. And it comprises around 5% of all strokes. And in this 5%, may, uh, the poor grade aneurysmal SH comprises around 20 to 20 percent to 50 percent the variation is uh, the variation is i mean differs from institute to institute uh, in some places uh, it, it comprises 20 percent of all the aneurysmal sh and in some places the, which are mainly referral centers it may comprise up to 50 percent of all the aneurysmal cases ruptured aneurysmal cases that they receive and by definition when we say poor grade aneurysmal sh then it means a wfns grade of four or five or a Hunter and Hess grade of three, four, and five. And in the C, according to the CT grading, it, it includes the Fisher grading of three and four and modified Fisher grading of three and four. And despite all the advances in the recent decades, uh, uh, mainly in the preoperative diagnosis and the perioperative management, the prognosis still remains dismal with a mortality of around 30 to 50%. And there is also a propensity to treat this uh, poor grade aneurysmal SH in elderly patients in a conservative manner. And patients treated in a conservative manner have ultimately have a bad outcome. So this is the WFNS grade and this is the Hunt and Hess grade. Other grades like Botterell grade are also there. But uh, what we mainly use is WFNS grade as it is a more objective way of grading. And uh, there is less inter-observer variability with WFNS grading. So grade four and five, that is a patient presenting with a GCS of less than 12 uh, with or without neurological deficit can be classified as uh, poor grade. And in Hunt and Hess grading, any patient presenting with drowsiness, stupor, or deep coma can be classified as grade poor grade. In the Fisher grading, this is the CT grading or the radiological grading. Uh, grade 3 and 4, and in modified Fisher grading, 3 and 4 comprise uh, poor grade subarachnoid hemorrhage. So in Fisher grading, grade 3 means a localized clot or a thick layer of subarachnoid blood. With, uh, in the vertical uh, layers greater than one millimeter thick. And grade four means presence of an intracerebral hematoma or intraventricular bleed with or without, uh, with diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage. In the modified Fisher grading, grade three involves dense SAH, dense SAH with no IVH. And in four, it means dense SAH with IVH in both ventricles, as you can see here. 
so the issues with poor grade sih are rebleeding is the risk of rebleeding is higher the risk of hydrocephalus is higher because of blood in the ventricles and then in blood in the ventricles and blood in the uh, in the cisterns and there is also raised icp there is also issue with vasospasm there is also delayed cerebral ischemia chances are more with poor, poor grade sih and there are the chances of medical complications like electrolyte imbalance cardiac issues pulmonary pulmonary edema infections etc are higher with poor, poor grade sih and there is the prolong the hospitalization is also prolonged with poor grade sih comp compared to good grade sih and the mechanisms for neurological deterioration mainly are early brain injury leading to blood brain barrier disruption activation of the inflammatory cascade and infl inflammation of the brain followed by raised icp due to edema or due to obstruction of the csf flow causing hydrocephalus and vasospasm of the large to medium vessels and microthrombosis impaired impairing the microcirculatory function in the smaller vessels and cortical spreading depolarization this is one of the theories proposed now and this is in vogue to explain explain patients who are in, who are having a delayed cerebral ischemia or uh, patients who have neurological deficits which are which can which are not uh, correlating with the ct scan findings so vasospasm typically occurs from day 3 to 14 and sometimes lasts up to 21 days it can involve medium to large vessels uh, it, the risk of vasospasm is higher if uh, if there if the presence of blood in cisterns is in huge quantity and uh, it, it is due to the oxyhemoglobin and release of free radicals and uh, symptomatics of vasospasm is manifested by decreased level of consciousness and new onset focal neurological signs and mutism so the only drug which has been approved for uh, vasospasm as with class one evidence is nemodipine so ne what we use is nemodipine in, in india mainly oral it is given orally 60 milligram fourth hourly and intravenous nemodipine is also given but uh, there is not much difference between oral nemodipine and intravenous uh, uh, nemodipine some other drugs which are used in japan are nicardipine fasudil hydrochloride etc and clazosentan uh, it is an endothelial one antagonist and despite angiographic evidence of decreased vasospasm there has not been much decrease uh, difference in the actual clinical outcome so endovascular options include direct arterial injection of fefavirin verapamil etc and balloon angioplasty but these are our short lasting procedures and need to be repeated again for a better understanding of this topic i would recommend to watch the webinar in acns webinar the talk given by professor mori where he deals extensively with this topic so in the medical management uh, triple h has been the backbone of medical manage in the magma in the medical management but there is uh, all these issues in are controversial all the three three things which are mentioned in uh, triple h need some correction actually hypervolemia is not advocated now euvolemia is advocated now and the fluid requirement the fluid that should be given should be 1.5 ml per kg per hour normal saline or ringer lactate and the positive balance should not be more than 500 ml and the therapeutic goal of systolic arterial blood pressure should be in the range of 120 to 150 millimeters of mercury in an unsecured aneurysm and after securing the aneurysm either by clipping or coiling the blood pressure can be raised up to uh, 160 to 200 millimeters using iv fluids and vasopressors like norepinephrine and for maintaining the adequate normovolemia or to maintain the adequate fluid ther therapy a central venous catheter can be placed and the pressure should be maintained at 8 to 12 millimeters of mercury potential life threatening complications uh, with uh, hypervolemia and hypertension can include rebleeding intracranial hypertension worsening of cerebral edema hemorrhagic transformation of cerebral infarct and hypertensive encephalopathy it can also cause pulmonary edema myocardial ischemia congestive heart failure and dilutional hyponatremia and hemodilution is not advised now because uh, hemodilution can impair the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood and further worsen the ischemia uh, the minimum required hemoglobin for the patient should be 8.5 to 10 milligrams and if the if the if the hemoglobin is less than 8.5 or 9 mg 9 grams then blood transfusion is advised now anti edema measures what we mainly rely on are mannitol 0.5 to 2 gram per kg body weight and uh, furosemide start dose of uh, 20 to 40 milligrams in an acute situation 
and uh, estrosolomide to decrease the cs of production and hyperventilation if you are using uh, it should be for only for a brief period a prolonged hyperventilation can cause uh, cerebral vasoconstriction and cause uh, further worsen the ischemia of the brain anti epileptics in subarachnoid hemorrhage is controversial uh, actual recommendation is to give anti epileptics only when the patient has a pre operative i mean in the she is in the pre operative period or in the post operative period but uh, in india we generally give anti epileptics as prophylactic uh, therapy for at least 6 months uh, because in follow up of these patients is very difficult and uh, so we generally recommend anti epileptics for 6 months here and if the patient has seizures then we generally use it for 2 uh, years analgesics generally if the patient is intubated then fentanyl fentanyl uh, in fentanyl plus midazolam is given or otherwise if the patient uh, or fent fentanyl patch can be used antacids are used to risk uh, decrease the risk of cushing's ulcers and also to re reduce the risk of aspiration pneumonia another controversial topic is antifibrinolytic therapy uh, uh, that is that is a epsilon amino capyloric acid or tranexamic acid it has shown to reduce the incidence of aneurysm rebleeding but the, it has not shown to change the outcome so and it can uh, using for a prolonged period can also lead to thrombotic complications so what is advised is to use the tranexamic acid until the aneurysm has been secured till clipping or coiling has been done and normothermia is advised now euglycemia is advised now laxatives or stool softeners are used in the pre operative period and also in the post operative period in the uh, in the pre operative period they, they decrease the risk of uh, aneurysm re rupture by uh, re this reduce the risk of aneurysm re rupture by preventing the straining of the patient for stools and intubation and ventilation in in when the patient gcs is less than 8 the patient may require intubation and ventilation or when the patient has a seizure in the pre operative period then also the patient may require intubation and ventilation so surgical management early surgery after stabilization of the general medical condition of the patient is advised and uh, many patients have different uh, medical conditions with cardiac problems patient may be on antiplatelets anticoagulants etc or other issues so early surgery should be done but only after optimizing the general medical condition of the patient so if we do the surgery within 24 hours uh, then it is known as ultra early management and if it is done within 24 to 72 hours then it is known as early management and if it is done more than 3 days then known as mid late so even this is uh, this timing has been different in different classifications but what we follow is this ultra early within 24 hours early within 24 to 72 hours mid late more than 3 days the advantages of surgery are in poor grade shg is that we can clean up the blood in the cisterns uh, thereby reducing the uh, severity of vasospasm and also you uh, apply uh, drugs like nicardipine pellets or nemodipine pellets or paste or use papaverin on the spastic vessels another surgical modality is external ventricular drainage it can be used in the pre operative period if there is acute hydrocephalus or sometimes it can be inserted in the uh, operating room just before surgery or uh, even after opening up the dura it can be uh, inserted it can be placed to drain the csf and obtain some brain relaxation so aneurysm clipping or coiling can be done it uh, depends on various factors like the patient gcs the age and the uh, comorbidities of the patient aneurysm morphology and location also and depending on the operator experience another advantage with surgery is that we can evacuate the hematoma and uh, decrease the mass effect and also decompressive craniectomy can be done if required and uh, another procedure surgical procedure that is frequently used is lumbar drain in the post operative period not in the pre operative period but in the post operative period that to if there is no mass effect so coming to my personal experience uh, my personal experience in the last 3 years uh, i have encountered around 16 cases of poor grade aneurysmal sh and most of them were in the grade 5 grade 5 and the three patients expired even before surgery and three if one patient expired immediately in the year and three two patients became brain dead uh, just before surgery so the operated cases were around 13 most of them were in the anterior circulation except for one pva pica aneurysm Uh, which was in the post uh, this is the only posterior circulation aneurysm that i had done in the poor grade aneurysmal sh so there were total of six mortality in the case series 
so i would like to present four cases four illustrative cases two cases which had good outcome and two cases which didn't have a good outcome so that at the end of the talk there would be a balanced uh, idea so this is the case one uh, you can see the, the, this is a 72 years old male patient presented on day one uh, of sah in the presented with a wfns grade of 5 and modified fissure grading of 4 you can see the thick thick uh, sah and also intraventricular hemorrhage and on ct angiogram there was a small supi anterior pointing uh, acom aneurysm and he presented in the night so we operated him on the next day morning so this is the surgical video i, I just wanted to show you this in poor grade aneurysmal sah there may be seizure cerebral edema so we need to do the skull based drilling skull based drilling and also uh, drilling of the projections on the orbital roof this is me drilling the projections on the orbital roof because even this one or two or three millimeters extra space that you get uh, can you help can help you very much in the surgery also the frontal base and the temporal base should be drilled out flat because this will help you in the surgery the bony work should be perfect so after the dura is open uh, the carotid optic cistern intraoptic cisterns are also open and this is uh, this is on the way to the aneurysm uh, if i encounter the lamina terminalis then i would like to open this lamina terminalis as well so that uh, some more csf can be released and uh, adequate brain relaxation is achieved so this is the aneurysm uh, small aneurysm projecting to the opposite side uh, i clip it with a single straight clip the clipping looks okay but actually it was uh, involving the opposite a1 so then i had to readjust it and use a mini clip with the curve upwards even this was not good so i readjusted it again now the opposite a1 is paired now i sp spent some time in clearing up the clots in the cisterns so this is me opening up the liliquist membrane in the carotid optic cistern so wall structure is a posterior clinoid so to communicate the posterior interparenchymal cistern with the carotid cistern so this is the immediate post operative ct scan of the patient taken on day 1 you can see that uh, some of the blood in the ventricles has cleared and in the cisterns has cleared so if you spend some time in clearing up the blood in the cisterns it is very helpful in when we suspect uh, when we see that there is brain edema then we don't fix the bone flap in such patients we just uh, leave it like that and uh, there have not been many any issue with uh, this technique so this patient was in the hospital for around 12 days and he was discharged on the 12th day the uh, only issue that he had in the post operative period was paralytic ileus and severe abdominal distension which persisted for around 5 to 6 days and finally he was discharged on the 12th day now he is doing well no resi residual neurological deficits so the case 2 another case uh, 55 years old male patient presented on day 1 with sudden onset headache and loss of consciousness and he had one episode of focal seizure and on presentation is wfns grade was 5 and modified fissure grade was 4 and on ct angiogram there was a left mci bifurcation aneurysm and uh, as there was a big hematoma frontal frontal and temporal hematoma on the left side decompressive craniectomy was done as he presented in the night and uh, and the next day morning aneurysm clipping was done and hematoma evacuation was done so here you can see the ct scan pre operative ct scan so this is the hematoma you can see the mass effect the ventricles have been pushed or at least the mass effect at least there is a midline shift of at least 1.5 cm so he was coning and uh, so immediately decompressive craniectomy was done so this is the mci bifurcation aneurysm that you can see here in the angiogram so this is the decompressive craniectomy done on the first on the first day night and then the following day aneurysm clipping was done 
the recorder was not the video recorder was not functioning so this was a shot taken from the screen directly so this was uh, clipped with a single curved clip by transylvan approach so this is the immediate post operative ct scan of the patient conservative evacuation of the hematoma was done as the hematoma was on the left side and the dominant side so we didn't evacuate the hematoma completely and the patient was in the hospital for around 17 days and he was discharged on discharged in a stable condition after two months this is his ct scan and uh, after two months we had done a mesh cranioplasty we had uh, ordered for a 3d cranioplasty mesh but that was not fitting well so we used a regular mesh cranioplasty and this is him after uh, uh, when he came for follow up for suture removal after cranioplasty and at that time he was he was wheelchair bound this case was done in july last year and uh, nearly in 11 months he has improved to this state now he is walking with uh, without support he has hemiparetic gait and he is using his left hand to write and his verbal function has also improved so now two cases which have not done well so this is a 73 years old male patient and he presented on the fourth day of pictus wfns grade 5 at presentation and modified fisher grade of 4 and on ct angiogram there was an echo aneurysm he fell down in the bathroom and initially the attenders thought that uh, he had sustained an head injury and he was conscious for 3 days so they didn't bring him to hospital but on the fourth day when he became unconscious he was brought to the hospital and then when we saw the ct scan we got suspicious and ordered a ct angio so you can see the you can see the thick sh here an intraventricular hemorrhage and on ct angiogram uh, you can see a wide based acom aneurysm which was inferior pointing and this case i had discussed with my friends here regarding management and the clipping strategy so both the actually intra both the a1s were equally dominant and uh, this was probably spastic and you can see here that the this is a short very short is uh, a1 segment i i was anticipating some difficulty in this uh, with this case and uh, in this case when we open the brain then then there was a cerebral edema so we tried to drain, drain some csf from the carotid optic system but you can see the thick clot there and the csf is not coming out so after after dissecting the ica this is the ica bifurcation and uh, this is the aca and this is the optic nerve so while uh, dissecting the aneurysm there was premature rupture you can see the blood coming and spilling onto the microscope so while dissecting the aneurysm then there was premature rupture then uh, in a minute or two i i gained consciousness and then this is my colleague dr ravi assisting me with the suctioning with a white bore uh, suction cannula and then we i put a temporary clip on the ipsilateral ica then i dissect out the opposite uh, a1 and put a temporary clip on the opposite a1 then i transfer the clip from the ipsilateral ica to the same side a1 now so after having control on both the a1s then i dissect out the dome so i tried parallel clipping in many ways but uh, it was not possible to clip uh, the aneurysm in a parallel way so finally i decided to go for a uh, decided to go for a picket fence type of clipping so this is the picket fence type of clipping clips been applied in parallel opposite opposite side temporary clip is removed and then after applying the final clip then ipsilateral temporary clip is also removed so we don't have icg in our microscope so we use intraoperative doppler so this is the intraoperative doppler probe to checking the in checking the ipsilateral a2 and the opposite a2 for patency this case we as there was cerebral edema we didn't replace the bone flap we removed the bone flap and uh, post operative ct scan somehow i missed it 
but uh, there was a small infarct there was a small infarct in the caudate nucleus on the left in the region of the caudate nucleus on the left side but his gcs was e4 vt and m4 and it was not improving so he had to undergo a tracheostomy and he was in the hospital for 14 days and meantime he developed a pneumonia a pneumonia and his as his general condition was not improving beyond a point his uh, uh, relatives didn't want to continue treatment and they took him home and he died in at home so the last case uh, case 4 uh, 56 years old male patient presented to us on the day 5 of ictus with a wfns grade of 5 and modified facial grade of 3 and on ct angio ct angio there was a uh, medial wall aneurysm in the supraclinoid supraclinoid region probably a blister aneurysm because uh, i don't know maybe a blister aneurysm and he was operated on the next day in the preoperative ct scan you can see the dense sh but no ivh and you can see that the, the aneurysm is very small and the supraclinoid segment with no place for a proximal clip so as part of surgical strategy we, we during this surgery we opened the cervical ica and we dissected the cervical ica and uh, and during temporary clipping here you can see that the uh, the severity of sh and the and uh, the, the brain is edematous angry and there is severe subpyel hemorrhage so so we go directly this was done in the initial days of covid and uh, we were only doing emergency cases so we didn't want to spend much time in the operation theater so we went by direct subfrontal approach and uh, after placing the temporary uh, bulldog clamp on the ica then uh, i dissect the proximal and the distal neck this is the carotid optic system clearing the clearing the thick clots in the systems as it, as it was suspected to a blister aneurysm i didn't want to handle much so i straight away go for clipping so this is one straight clip standard straight clip applied directly followed by another mini clip no another standard clip so we didn't spend much time in clearing up the blood in the cisterns in this case in the in the immediate you can see that the brain is bit lax here this is the dural margin and the brain is falling down so we thought that uh, we can replace the bone flap and uh, we replaced the bone flap but that was probably a mistake so you can see this uh, this is the post operative ct scan on the first day Uh, we didn't go do a transylvian dissection so that uh, sh that was in the uh, sylvian system is still there there is brain edema the bone flap is getting lifted and there is also hypodensity in the uh, frontal and temporal regions so probably he was developing an infarct due to vasospasm probably and on the first post operative day he was eye opening his eyes spontaneously he was on ventilator and then he was uh, localizing to pain so we thought he was improving and then we extubated him on the first day also and but suddenly on the second day maybe due to cerebral edema or some other reason he deteriorated and expired suddenly so the issues that i faced uh, intraoperatively was intraoperative brain edema it's a difficult problem with poor grade sh and the difficulty to put in evd intraop so i have this is one of the methods described in human test book of surgery which was intake uh, which was taken from uh, taken from apuzo test book complication avoidance and management the method described here is to draw an isosceles triangle this is the sphenoid ridge from here you have to draw a 2.5 cm and from the sylvian veins also you have to draw another 2.5 cm so as to make this an an isosceles triangle with the hypotenuse on the sylvian veins so and from here you can directly insert a, a evd catheter directly perpendicular to the brain but uh, i have tried this uh, two or three times but i have not been successful probably because of the cerebral edema maybe this measurements change uh, i have not been able to uh, put an evd through this method so if i have to do an evd now probably i would uh, do a opposite side frontal bar hole put in an evd and then change the position and uh, open the skull and the difficult issue with the uh, uh, poor grade sh is the thick clot in the systems 
especially with late presentations as i've shown in the last two cases which were presented on the day four and five with late presentations the clot may be very thick and may be very difficult to evacuate so in summary i would like to say that earlier the surgery better the outcome but only after optimizing the patient and vasospasm and raised icp are not the only reasons for deterioration many of the many of our patients who have expired are not because of neurological reasons but to, due to medical issues infections and other reasons and perioperative systemic management is as important as neurological management and the outcomes varies dif uh, varies differently in among the young and the elderly and also the outcome is different in the grades 4 and 5 grade 5 has a different outcome and grade 4 has a better outcome so grouping together all young elderly grade 4 and grade 5 maybe and grading uh, it maybe is not good thing maybe is not right thing centers which have high volume can probably differentiate and give uh, a better uh, prognostic uh, percentage and many patients can recover with good management so we should try our best so this is our team of neurosurgeons at our hospital our senior colleague dr mohan dr ravi who assisted me in most cases so dr vijay and myself and a few pictures from the past memories uh, one winter afternoon in Nag in nagoya professor kato dr kushik dr takizawa dilshod and this this dr yoko yoko just sorry no say and uh, yamada dr kawase dr samashima dr k dr uh, vlad and his wife and this was me in asai kawa with dr takizawa strictly monitoring how i am doing the suturing micro suturing with professor sano with professor uh, watanabe professor nakadani dr ishu alberto uh, thomas and thomas is missing in this picture but he is here uh, dr ishu uh, itti dr itti dr raja dr sham and all my friends some friends dr kalyan dr balaji who are all alumni member dr kamat all of them are alumni members thank you all for giving me this uh, opportunity and for patient watching thank you thank you sandeep thank you very much for your uh, talk very interesting talk uh, and topic actually uh, there are probably many questions uh, we don't have so much time because uh, uh, the acnf ns young neurosurgeons webinar will start soon but i think we have time for a couple of questions uh, from uh, the audience if someone has a question uh, i i can start with one question um, regarding actually uh, how to manage this kind of patients so in this period we in our institution we are actually uh, reviewing revising our experience uh, uh, with the management of poor grade uh, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and i agree with you uh when you say that uh, outcome can be very different some people of course die and but other people can recover um in some cases of course we we operate immediately if there is a hematoma with mass effect but uh, if uh, that's not the case uh, uh, we have the policy uh, to place an evd and see whether there is a, a at least a, a initial improvement in uh, in uh, g uh, in, in the glasgow comma scale before deciding uh, whether to treat or not uh, what do you think about this kind of management yeah evd uh, even i agree with you but uh, evd i think can precipitate uh, rebleeding so with evd there is also even with intermittent drainage or continuous drainage there is also a risk of rebleeding so even if i if the patient comes with a gcs of 3 and there are mot no motor response there is no motor response then i will agree i agree with you that uh, we should put in an evd and hopefully see if the patient is improving and if he is improving then proceed or and if he is not improving then maybe we shouldn't proceed and the case that i presented case 2 uh, which who presented with the large frontotemporal hematoma actually when he presented his gcs was 3 so uh, i was not sure uh, whether we should uh, go for the uh, clipping but after uh, after uh, doing a decompressive craniectomy when we checked on the next day uh, his gcs has surprisingly improved so we proceeded with the clipping on that day so 
uh, EVD is a little uh, risky strategy, but maybe it should be decided on a case to case basis. Yeah. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, any other question? Yeah, may I ask Sandeep? Yeah, Raja. Yeah, hello, Sandeep. Yeah, Raja. Yeah, first of all, let me congratulate you for this uh, very good series that you have shown us. It is really interesting strategy of putting an EVD and whether the patient improves or not. This is a standard which is followed all throughout the world, maybe where in our hospital also, which is one of the largest centers where we operate aneurysms. This is the same thing that we follow. We put in AVD and then wait if the patient improves. And age is a critical factor in you know, deciding upon where to go ahead with the surgery or not. If it's a young age, definitely we'll take a chance. But in elderly people, if there is no improvement, we, we, we generally don't go ahead for surgery. And regarding the pains point that you showed where you were not able to cannulate, uh, well, I, I have 100% success in cannulating the pains point. There is another point, modified pains point, which is 2.5 centimeter more anterior to the initial pain point. So, so if you cannot uh, uh, cannulate the pain point, pains point, you can go 2.5 centimeter further ahead and cannulate and you will be definitely able to successfully cannulate that frontal horn of the ventricle. You, uh, you will try next time. So what will be the angulation perpendicular to the perpendicular, brain? Directly perpendicular to the brain. Directly perpendicular to the Even with patients in cerebral edema. Yeah. You may you have to go a bit more deeper because of the swelling of the brain, but you will be able to cannulate it. Okay. Yeah, I, I have the same experience as, uh, as Raja. Yeah perpendicular to the surface. Uh, and I, I think I never had problems to, to cannulate the ventricle in this, okay. with this technique. Okay, I will try. Oh, maybe other... you can ask Professor Wada the last comment. Yes, please, Professor Wada, would you like to give a final comment about this session, please? Thank you. Uh, very nice presentation about uh, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, that's a very big program for us to how, how to manage the uh, poor grade subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, in Japan, maybe the coil embolization is more popular than the direct creeping. I usually used to do the same way, uh, direct creeping. And uh, every time I use the extra ventricular uh, drainage uh, you all, all already mentioned. Also, the after the operation, I do the uh, the compressive craniectomy every time for the uh, poor grade because of the brain edema is uh, very critical for the patients after the surgery. I uh, recommend uh, maybe uh, all the patients you experience the poor grade subarachnoid hemorrhage if you do the um, direct creeping uh, with the decompressive craniectomy also. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I have a question. When you are using a EVD, do you prefer continuous drainage or uh, intermittent drainage? I usually use the continuous drainage after the operation. And for how many days? And uh, EVD, uh, it depends on the patient's condition. I always do the also the uh, cisterna drainage too. If the cisterna drainage effective, not necessary to use the uh, extra, extra ventricular drainage anymore. So um, usually, if the cisterna drainage is effective, I usually e, 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 to, e, uh, e, to finish the external ventricular drainage within uh, two or three days. And do you use a lumbar, a lumbar drain in poor grade SH patients? Uh, if the very first day, 
uh, before post surgery the, the post operative period no no i uh, i mean uh, if uh chron first i use the evd and the cystic drainage for seven days after the seven days is the patient need more drainage i change to the uh lumbar drainage okay because of the infection problem Thank you for these comments. Uh, Professor Cato, uh, do you want to uh, give your closing remarks? Thank you very much, uh, the both uh, the great speakers. So we learned a lot uh, from the two uh, talks, especially Professor Vada. Uh, he is uh, really expert of the, especially the vascular, the neurosurgery. Maybe we can ask him again and again for presentation. And also, the Sandeep, thank you very much for a nice presentation, even very difficult issue, I see. The severe degree 3, 4, sometimes 3, 5, is uh, it's almost uh, very difficult, the topics, I see. So many tricks and tips for direct surgery, and also uh, even the endovascular treatment, we need some, uh, some uh, ideas. In Japan, more, uh, more and more, the endovascular plus cystic drainage, something like that. So anyway, the, thank you very much. And uh, the Albays, thank you very much for a nice organization of this uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one last question uh, from the audience. How much ICP threshold do you use to drain CSF continuous? Uh, uh, we don't have ICP monitoring. We don't use ICP monitoring. Okay. So okay. <laughs> this question probably I cannot answer. Well, in my institution, we just leave uh, the um, EVD uh, like uh, 15 or 20 centimeters from the tragus right. and leave it open. So for the communicating vessels, you know, uh, it, it's possible for the patient to drain CSF uh, uh, in a continuous way. This was just to complete the answer. Uh, for the person who asked uh, in our chat. Okay, thank you very much uh, to uh, all of you. Uh, uh, it's better to close here because we have another webinar uh, starting now uh, from the ACNS, uh, Young Neurosurgery Committee. So thank you very much. We will see again uh, next month uh, for the next uh, uh, Alumni Association webinar. Thank you to our speakers, Professor thank Wada. You. Dr. Thank Sandy, you. thank you, thank you. Uh, Professor thank Yoko Kato, and thank you to all of you.